So thankful that you're here this morning. So thankful for our students. And what a great song to end on. That for those of us that are in Christ, we know that we are chosen, that we are loved. What good news for those of us that are followers of Christ. And what good news that is offered to those of you that are not yet Christians, uh, that you too can know the love of God in such a magnificent way. We're so thankful that you're here. If you have a Bible, let me invite you to open it up and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 52. The central event in human history is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, the three days on the calendar of human history that are the most important three days are those in which Jesus crucified, he, was, he died, he was buried, and then on the third day, he rose to new life. And often when we think about him, when we talk about the crucifixion of Jesus, we're often in awe at the physical suffering of Christ. Uh, we think about the beating that he received, uh, the leather strap that was laced with bone and rock fragments and the way that his flesh was ripped away from his body. We often think about how that crown of thorns was thrust violently upon his brow or how long metal spikes were driven through his hands and feet in order to hang him on a tree. And then he was suspended into the air where he suffocated in his own blood and died. For those of us that are Christians, that are followers of Jesus, that have had our sins forgiven. We often think about the spiritual suffering that was going on behind the physical brutality. The fact that it wasn't just that Jesus was being beaten. It wasn't just that he was receiving the crown of thorns, but also that on that tree, Jesus was taking the sins of the world upon himself. And then in the place of our sin, Jesus was receiving the wrath, the judgment of God in our place. That, that Jesus on the cross was experiencing what it means to be cut off from the goodness of God. That Jesus on the cross was experiencing what it means to be forsaken by God. But when I look at the cross, what really brings me to awe is not just the physical suffering of Jesus. It's not even just the spiritual sufferings of Jesus. But what really brings me to this point of awe is that to exact detail, what Jesus experienced on the cross was prophesied, predicted, promised, prepared for 700 years before Jesus was even born. Isaiah was a prophet in the Old Testament. God raised him up to be a mouthpiece so that God could reveal his direct revelation to Isaiah. And then through Isaiah, the word could be proclaimed to the people. Isaiah was a prophet during some pretty rebellious days of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah in which the people, they turned their hearts in rebellion away from their God. They turned their eyes away from gazing on the beauty of God. They turned their ears away from obeying the words of God. And the people were in utter chaos and, and, and despair. And yet God sent Isaiah to promise that one day God would raise up a servant and this special choice servant would do something special for the people. He would take the sins upon the people and that this servant would be broken so that those who are broken could be fixed. That this servant would be pierced through for the transgressions of the people so that transgressors, so that sinners could be healed and set free. And this good news was authored 700 years before Jesus was even born. Exact detail, so much so that if you were to take what we're going to read in Isaiah 52 and 53 and compare it to the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you would be all struck with how exact Isaiah's prophecy was that was fulfilled 700 years later. So with your Bibles open to Isaiah 52, let me invite you to stand to your feet as we honor the reading of our sovereign God's perfect word, all about his son, Jesus. Beginning verse 13, behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. 
as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry land. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and we've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is left to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears a silence. So we opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off in the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days. And the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore... I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death, it was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is God's word. Let's go to him in prayer for help. Almighty God, we praise you for your son Jesus, who was smitten in the place of sinners who was pierced through instead of rebels like us. We thank you for Jesus, the fulfillment of this song. We pray, oh God, that you would give us eyes to behold Jesus, ears to hear Jesus, hearts to believe Jesus, and to worship Jesus. We pray that today, even in this Old Testament text that was written 700 years before the birth of Jesus, we pray that we would behold, that we would gaze on, that we would be in awe of, and that we would make much of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray and believe. Amen. You can have a seat. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great 19th century Baptist preacher of London, said of this text that we just read that this is the Bible in miniature, that it's the essence of the gospel, that in these short verses we see Jesus more clearly than in any other text in the entirety of the Bible. Isaiah prophesied for many, many years, but the apex, the climax of his prophecies is what is known as this, the suffering servant song. It's broken into five stanzas, and each stanza has three verses. And I want you to notice the very first verse of the song in chapter 52, verse 13, is the word behold, to look upon, to gaze upon with awe. To look at the servant with jaws dropped open, with eyes wide open, with hearts receiving, to gaze upon and to worship this servant. The reason that Isaiah preached this word to the peoples of Judah and Israel was that they would behold and that they would look upon and that they would hope in the servant to come. And the reason that Isaiah's prophecies are recorded in Holy Scripture and read even today in 2023 is so that we too will look back on the servant who has already come, who has already been crucified, who has already been buried, who has already been resurrected, and that we would behold him that we would gaze on him, that we would see him, that we would be in awe of him, that we would worship him. So that's my invitation this morning. I invite you to join me in this text, 
beholding the servant. So what I want us to do is I want us to walk through these five stanzas, and in each stanza, I want to give you a couple aspects in which you behold as we look to Jesus. As we look at the first stanza in chapter 52, verses 13 through 15, I want to invite you to behold the divinity and the deformity. When you look at this opening stanza, you realize that the servant that is being predicted and promised and prophesied is a man. He's got human flesh. He's got hair follicles. He's got fingernails and toes. He's a man just like we are people. We're humans. But we read in verse 14 that his appearance was so marred beyond human symbols. This man is not just any man, but he's a man that supposedly is beaten and bloodied and bruised to the point that we can't even recognize him. And yet, as Isaiah speaks to us about this servant, this man who comes in deformity, being marred, we also realize in the text that he's not just a man. Notice verse 13. He says, behold my servant. And then he says, he, the servant, will be high and lifted up. He will be exalted. Now, if you read the entire prophecy of Isaiah from the first chapter to the last, you realize that Isaiah only a few times uses his languages of high and lifted up. And every time that he uses that language, he's speaking about Yahweh, the Lord. The first occasion is found in the text that many of us looked at last Sunday on the Lord's Day, Isaiah 6 in which the prophet ran into the temple, and the Lord gave him a vision. And what did Isaiah see? He saw the Lord. He saw Yahweh in his grandeur, in his majesty, in his glory, in his holiness. And what does Isaiah say? That the Lord was high and lifted up. And now we're being told all these years later, all these chapters later, that the servant who is a man who is deformed will not just be a deformed man, but he will also be the Lord who is high and lifted up. What we have here is a picture of a holy God and a deformed man in one person. That is Jesus Christ. He is both God and man and one unique person person who comes among us and the way that God reveals his glory, the way that the Lord shows his greatness and grandeur is not by his servant being placed in a castle on a throne wearing a crown of gold. The moment in which God reveals the glory of his servant more than any other moments is when his servant is hung naked on a tree with a crown of thorns on his brow. The entire suffering servant song is introduced by this unique person who is both God, he is divine, he is deity, but he's also man. He is bloodied and bruised and broken to the point that we can't even recognize him. And notice in verse 15 that we read that he will come and he will sprinkle the nations. That word can also be he will startle the nations. The nations will be startled at the appearance of the Son of God in flesh broken like this. Kings' mouths will come open when they recognize that this God actually comes down and would condescend to the point of taking on human flesh, but not just coming among us, but dying for us. That the way that he reveals his glory is not by coming on Mount Olympus, but by coming on Mount Calvary. The king's mouths will come open. The nations will be startled that this is how God chooses to reveal his might and his power. But the word can also be translated sprinkle. For the ancient Jews, the idea of sprinkling always reminded them of the Day of Atonement and the other sacrifices. And it always would remind them of that day in the wilderness after coming out of Egypt in which Moses and Aaron killed sacrificial animals. And what did the Lord tell them to do? 
to sprinkle the people with blood as a sign that the children of Israel were now in relationship with God, that their sins have been forgiven. And yet this divine, deformed man will come and his blood will not just sprinkle the people of Israel. He won't just sprinkle people who speak one language or have one skin color. He will come and his blood shed on the cross will sprinkle all nations. His sacrifice will be ultimate. His sacrifice will be universal. His sacrifice will be more than the sacrifice of the blood of the goats and the blood of the bulls and the blood of the lambs before him. First, we must behold the divine servant who comes as a man and is deformed. But as we move into the second stanza, beginning in chapter 53, we need to behold the revelation and the rejection. Notice Isaiah begins with a hypothetical rhetorical question. Who has believed what he's heard from us? Isaiah is saying, no one has been paying attention. Notice verse, uh, end of verse 1. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? What is Isaiah saying? Isaiah is saying is that the Lord will reveal himself through his servant. That when we see this deformed man, we're not just seeing a messenger sent by God, like Isaiah is a messenger, like Isaiah is a prophet. He's not just a heavenly being like Michael and Gabriel that from time to time are sent by God to do God's bidding. It's not like one of the seraphim that we saw in Isaiah 6 that are sent by God to grab a burning coal to cauterize the lips of Isaiah. No, the one who comes, this servant who is being prophesied, will be himself a revelation. He won't preach a revelation. He'll be a revelation. He won't give a message. He himself will be God's message. And he will come on the scene bursting forth and nobody will be prepared for it. Look at verse 2. It's like a root out of dry ground. The picture here that Isaiah is presenting is a desert wilderness where the ground is cracked because of a lack of irrigation, because of a lack of water, and yet from it will sprout forth a plant. From it, when nobody nobody is looking for it, when no one thinks that a plant could grow in that climate, bam, here will come a plant. And isn't that exactly what we read in the Gospels? Sure, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, And the angels went and revealed the good news to the shepherds. And the shepherds went to look upon baby Jesus. And sure, the Magi traveled hundreds of miles in order to give baby Jesus gifts. But then Jesus and his mom and dad had to run off to Egypt. And by the time they spent a couple years there, and they come back to Nazareth, where Jesus grew up for the next 25 years, no one knows anything about him. No one hears from him. There's nothing special about him until that day he bursts forth on the scene when he comes to the banks of the Jordan River and his cousin, who's been hanging out in the desert eating bugs and wild honey, is baptizing people in the River Jordan. And he looks at Jesus and he points and he says, Behold, the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. For the first time in Holy Scripture, the Lamb that takes away sins is not an animal. For the first time in Scripture, the sacrifice to be offered is not an animal. John says, behold, that's the actual lamb. That's the lamb that all other lands are pointing to. And Jesus was baptized. He was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and nights by Satan. And then over the next three years, God revealed who Jesus was. He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He preached good news to the poor. He raised the dead like Lazarus. He fed the 5,000. Then he fed the 4,000. He revealed himself. He came on the scene and nobody was paying attention to him. Nobody was thinking that this man was anything. And yet all of a sudden God reveals who he is. And yet even then he was rejected. Middle of verse 2, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. There was no beauty. There was nothing attractive about him. Verse 3, he was despised. He was rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows, meaning that he was acquainted with grief. He knew rejection because he experienced it in and of himself. His own brothers rejected him. 
His own kinsmen rejected him. His own people, the Jews, rejected him. The Roman Empire, they rejected him. Everyone around Jesus, though he revealed who he was to them, he cared for the sick, for the poor, for the destitute, for the needy. He cared for those that no one cared for. And yet in the end, except for a small band, they all deserted him. He was revealed as the gloriously defined but deformed God in flesh. And that he was rejected. He was looked upon and the men hid their faces. If we want to understand Jesus, if we want to truly behold him in all of his magnitude and glory, if we truly want to see him exalted and lifted up, we must begin with him being rejected and despised and not believed and hated and cast down. Because this prepares the way for the third stanza, which is the crescendo, the apex, the climax of the entire song. And here we behold the substitution and the salvation. Verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. We read that verse and it's a great verse about Jesus dying in the place of sinners. But I think sometimes we actually miss the gravity of the verse. You see, when Isaiah preached this message for the very first time, he preached it to a group of Jews that only had the Old Testament scriptures. And when they thought of something coming in both, verse 4, bearing their griefs and their sins and carrying away their sins, immediately their minds would have gone to one place in Scripture, Leviticus chapter 16. In Leviticus chapter 16, God through Moses established for the people a special day that would take place one day a year, the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And on that day, the high priest would take two spotless goats. Upon one, the sins of the people would be transferred and the goat would be killed and its blood would be sprinkled on the altar as a sign that this goat has taken the penalty for sin. It's taken, the, it's taken the transgressions of the people and the punishment and judgment they, rece- they deserve upon himself. The other goat, the sins of the people would be placed upon, and then it would be carried outside the walls of the city into the del- wilderness where it would be let go as a symbol, as a reminder that the sins of the people had been removed, had been carried away as far as the east is from the west. It wasn't just enough that one goat died in the place of the sinners, but also that the other goat carried the sins of the people away. It wasn't just enough that the people's sins were carried away. Something had to die as a judgment for the sins. And yet now Isaiah is prophesying that a day is coming when he, this divine deformed servant, will fulfill the role of both goats. That he will come and he will bear the grief, the sins, the guilt of the people and he'll die for the people. He'll die as their substitutionary sacrifice. But when he dies, he will simultaneously carry out what the second goat did. And he will take the sins of the people as far as the east is from the west. So much so that if you are in Christ, it is not just enough to say that Jesus died to take away your sin. But you must also say that Jesus died to take away your sin and never bring it back up again. Jesus died in the place as the fulfillment of these goats so that our past sins, our present sins, our future sins have already been paid for through his death and they have already been removed so that when God looks upon those of us who are in Christ... Those of us who put faith in Jesus, he doesn't look upon us any longer as guilty rebel sinners, but he sees us covered in the blood of Jesus. And when they, Isaiah's original readers, would have read this, the news truly would have been too good to be true. You're saying that there is a divine man who will come? And we won't need those Day of Atonement goats anymore. 
You're saying that he will willingly die as a substitute for sinners? And that's exactly what Isaiah is saying. He will be stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. And the question is why? Why will he do it? Verse 5 tells us he will be wounded for our transgressions. He will be crushed for our iniquities. He will be chastised to bring us peace. He will be beaten and his back will be striped so that we who deserve to be beaten and striped for our sins will be healed. Don't you, don't you see this good news? It's that Jesus is substituting himself willingly in the place of sinners and he's taken the judgment, the wrath, the punishment that we deserve for our sins and he's taking it upon himself and he's being crushed for it. This servant who was promised would come and he would do away with the sins of the people by dying in their place. And here's what's incredible. When this prophecy was given, it was seven centuries before the birth of Jesus. So that generations and generations and generations of Jews would have read this text and wondered, who's going to be the servant? When's he going to come? Did we miss him? And when Jesus comes up on the scene, he does exactly what Isaiah 53 says he would do. He substitutes some place and the place of sinners so that sinners could experience God's salvation. And yet the people rejected him. They didn't believe in him. They didn't trust him. They didn't behold him. They didn't heed the words of Isaiah, chapter 52 and verse 13. They didn't behold God's servant. They didn't gaze upon Jesus and see his beauty. They just said he has no beauty. They didn't gaze upon him and to see his glory. They just said in their hearts, he has no glory. Which is why this third stanza ends with an indictment on humanity in verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. You know what Isaiah did not say? Is that there are two categories of people, the mostly good and the mostly bad. The mostly good, you know, are those that attend church and go to Sunday school and BBS. They sing in the student choir. They bring their kids to church. They vote the right way. They serve their community. They're good neighbors. They cut their grass, all those good things. But they've got a couple of little mistakes that they just need to be cleared up a little bit. But then you've got those pagans over here that they hate God, that they run away from God. We're the mostly good living in the buckle of the Bible belt. But everybody else on planet Earth, they're the mostly bad. That's not what Isaiah says. He doesn't break humanity into two categories. He doesn't say that there are those that at June, they put this kind of rainbow out, but the rest of us, we put that kind of rainbow out during the month of June. He doesn't break us into those that vote for Republican or those who vote for Democrat. He doesn't break us into those kind of categories. He puts us all in one indicted category of a bunch of dumb sheep that run away willingly from our good shepherd. All we like sheep have gone astray, and every single one of us has turned to his own way. Your sins, my sins, may look different than sins of someone that wasn't born in central Alabama, but please hear me, we're not in a better category. We are equally sinful and cut off because of our sins from a holy, righteous God. And yet, the stanza ends, but the Lord has laid on the servant the iniquity of us all. I hear from time to time that there are just some people that are not savable. They're just too bad. And I understand that I haven't experienced what some of you have through your life in the military or Others, but please hear me. You're not believing the Bible. Because the Bible says that we're all in one big category of straying sheep that are cut off from the goodness of God. 
And yet God in his grace allowed his son to be substituted in our place so that we could receive God's salvation. And Jesus willingly stood in our place to offer salvation to sinners. And that's good news. But after this great climax, we move into the fourth stanza, beginning of verse 7, in which we need to behold the sinlessness and the silence. Over and over, beginning verse 7, we read that he was oppressed and afflicted, but he didn't open up his mouth. He was like a lamb who just gently, quietly went to be sheared, to be slaughtered. He didn't say anything to defend himself. And if we were to open up the Gospels, we would see that this is exactly true of Jesus. In Matthew 26, verses 62 through 63, Jesus is on trial before the Jewish high priest Caiaphas, and that he doesn't defend himself. He doesn't open his mouth. Then in Mark 15, 4 through 5, he's placed in front of the Roman governor Pilate, and yet again, he doesn't justify his actions. He doesn't defend himself. He keeps his mouth shut. Then in Luke chapter 23, verse 9, we see that he stands before Herod, who's kind of a Roman and a Jew, and yet he also doesn't say a word. And I think sometimes in the Gospels, we read this, and we just think, okay, well, that's cool. Uh, he didn't really, he didn't want to say anything, except for, let me submit this to you. Had Jesus opened up his mouth and defended himself, had Jesus opened up his mouth and justified his actions, number one, he would have gone against Isaiah's prophecy. Therefore, he would have broken God's word. Therefore, he couldn't be our sacrifice. Or number two, what if he had defended himself and Pilate, Caiaphas, or Herod had to believe him and let him go? We would be in trouble. He didn't open up his mouth in fulfillment of the scriptures so that those three men would sentence him to death. And so that through his death, we might have life. But it wasn't just enough that he didn't say anything. But notice the end of that stanza at the very end of verse 9. It says not only were there no words in his mouth, but there was no deceit in his mouth either. Meaning that Jesus was blameless. He was sinless. Why does the substitute of Jesus do anything for us? Because it's the only one who doesn't deserve to die. Dying in the place of all of us who do deserve to die. See, it would do nothing for someone like me who deserves to die and receive the judgment of God to die for some of you who also deserve to die and receive the judgment of God. There would be nothing that would take place. The only way that the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus could count for anything is if he was a sinless sacrifice. So he remained silent so that he could remain sinless. He remained quiet so that he could be our Savior. He remained silent so that he could maintain his sinlessness. And it's only in his sinless death that we're given life. Then finally, we get to the last stanza, beginning of verse 10 of chapter 53. And here we need to behold the unyielding plan and the ultimate triumph. I think that chapter 3, verse 10, may be one of the most disturbing verses, not just in Isaiah, but in all the Bible. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. You see, we love to talk about how Jesus loved us so much that he died for us, which is true. We had a whole stanza about that. Jesus substituted himself in the place of sinners. He was striped, he was beaten so that we could be healed. He took the place of transgressors so that we could be forgiven. He bore our griefs so that we could be set free. Yes, yes, he did it for us. But that's not the only reason he did it. According to verse 10, the unyielding plan of God before he ever said, let there be light, was that the Son of God would take on flesh, that the divinity would become deformed, though he would be revealed, he would be rejected, he would die as a substitute to bring salvation, and this would be the unyielding plan of God. It is the glory and the plan of God to crush the Son, Jesus. 
It wasn't just us that was on the mind of Jesus when he was on the cross. It was the glory and the renown of his father. The Bible is radically God-centered. Isaiah 52 and 53 is radically God-centered about the glory of God. First Santa begins with the servant being high and exalted on a tree. And it ends with the Savior's death being crushed under the judgment of God. And that too, bringing glory to God. Because that was his plan from the beginning. The cross of Jesus was not plan B. It was not plan C. It wasn't a tertiary plan. It was the plan from the beginning for the salvation of sinners like us. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would be crushed by God in the place of sinners. But that's not how it ends. Look at verse 11. It says, out of the anguish of a soul, he shall see and be satisfied. How can a dead man see? How can a dead man be satisfied? The answer is he can't. You see, this, this song is actually a chronological poem about Jesus. It begins and stands on one with the Son of God becoming a man in his incarnation. And it ends with Jesus, the Son of God, being crushed and dying, being cut off from the land of living and yet able to see again. Jesus being crushed by the Father Dying in the place of sinners and yet being satisfied. The only way that a dead man can be satisfied, the only way that a dead man can see again is that if he comes back from death, if he overcomes the grave, if he conquers over death, and that's what the text says that the servant will do, and that's exactly what the gospels tell us Jesus has done. Yes, Jesus died as a substitute for sinners to bring forth salvation, and yet after three days in the tomb, on the third day, he saw again, his eyes were open, his air excuse me, air filled his lungs once again. He began to breathe. He began to see. He began to speak. And once again, he was satisfied. Why was he satisfied? Because all that he came to do had been accomplished. The mission was done, complete. And then at the end of the stanza, at the end of the song, we get this beautiful summary at the end of chapter 53, verse 12. That he bore the sins of many. And now we make intercession. You know what's interesting? As a grammar nerd, I noticed this. That Isaiah prophesies 700 years before Jesus is born. But he says everything in the past tense about the servant has already done as if it's accomplished. But at the end of the song, we go from past tense to present tense. He was pierced. He was cut off. He was crushed. He died. And now he makes presently intercession. Because Jesus' death is in the past, it is done, it is final. And yet because he lives even today, for those of us that are sinners, how do we know that we're in the right with the holy God? Because Jesus is interceding for us right now. In this moment, he is interceding in our place. He is our mediator right now. He died in our place. He died as a substitute for sinners. And now he lives. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus. Lord, I thank you that Jesus is the fulfillment of this suffering servant song. Lord, I thank you that Jesus is the one that died in our place as a substitute for sinners. That he was willing to be striped and bruised and beaten and marred beyond even being able to recognize so that sinners like us could be forgiven. But I thank you even more that after Jesus died, he rose again. So that now he intercedes for us. He mediates for us. He stands in our place. So Father, I pray that you would help us to behold Jesus. 
that we would not just sing songs about Jesus, but that we would look into the word and that we would have a passion to a hold and gaze on Jesus. That we would be passionate about what Christ has done and that we would praise him. It's in his name that we pray and believe. Amen.